Playing the Bart's Tale on the C64 back in the day was pure magic to me. You might have similar memories about other games like Dungeon Master, Eye of the Beholders or so many others. Today, programming for Commodore computers is no less magic to me. Even better, today I can create the magic. In this video, we will use Commodore Basic Magic to create a small program that allows us to walk through a dungeon that's defined by a simple map. Trust me when I say, once I figured it all out, it was way easier to build this than I originally thought. And also trust me when I say the first-person grid-based role-playing game is not that. More about that at the end of the video. This is the 8-bit theory where things might be obsolete, but far from useless. If you played dungeon crawlers back in the day, or to be more precise, first-person grid-based crawlers, you surely have hand-drawn your own maps by using pen and paper. That means in your brain you have mapped the first-person view to a top-down view. Now, when we want to create our crawling engine, we have to do the opposite. We design the dungeon map top-down, but we'll need to find a way to transform it into a first-person view. There's actually two ways to design a dungeon. By placing blocks, which is what's done by Bart's Tale when you're roaming the streets of Scarabray and Stangra Main, one house is a block which defines the walls. And the other way is to place walls themselves, which are actually the lines between the blocks, and the Bart's Tale did this for the dungeons. In this video I will cover the first one, if you also want the second type being covered in a video, please let me know in the comments. Ok, let's just take a map like this, sized 8x8. We will use 1 for the walls and zeros for the free areas. And we will have blocks around the map, so we do not have to handle looking into the void. And then we will just place some blocks on the map to have some hallways to move around in. In code. We will not use a two-dimensional array, but just a single dimension. Both approaches have pros and cons, I just had to make a decision. So we will just put the ones and zeros into data statements and use read to put them into the map array. Now how can we transform this into a first-person view? The first-person view consists of several elements. We have to decide how many blocks we want our vision to go and how broad the field of view should be. I decided for 3 fields far and 5 fields broad. That might seem a bit too limited to a modern day view, so I suggest you take a look at games you like from back in the day to see how they did it. Looking at the first person view screenshot, we can divide the screen into several parts. There is the field we are standing on. If we have walls to the left or right, we will only see parts of them. A wall in front of us shows as a full wall, covering nearly all of the screen. And so it goes for all the blocks on the map that are inside our field of view. As you can see in the top-down view here, each of the walls has a number assigned. We will use these to check visibility of each wall and to create the list of visible walls for each rendering cycle. If we just draw the elements in the order of far away first to close by last, the closer elements can easily override the ones further away. The unfortunate part is the drawing routines of Commodore Basic are too slow to allow us to fill the shapes, so that's why we will just go with a wizardry style wireframe version. And as you can see, walls closer to us do not cover those behind them. It's no big problem to solve that by partial drawing, and I already did, but I will cover that in a different video. Now, how do we find out which lines to draw and which ones to skip, because they are hidden behind the wall anyways? I spent some time thinking about this, and I found out that it is not too complicated to get this done. For a start, we will need to know two things. Where are we on the map, and which direction are we facing? And then we can easily track which objects block which other objects. It works like this. We are standing here. When we look straight ahead, we have to check which walls are visible. We are on tile B. If tile E is a block, then we see a wall. If not, we can go ahead and check the tile behind. If it's there, we want to draw a wall. 
If not, we can go ahead again and check the tile behind. Same goes for the sides. If there is a block to the left of us on tile A, we want to render a wall. If not, we want to check if there is a block next to it in our facing direction, which is block D, and so on. As you can see, this can lead to elements being only partly displayed. Either their left side can be visible or their right hand side or both sides of an element can be visible. So this is how we can create a list of coordinates we want to check, one after the other. As soon as an element is visible, we add it to our list of elements to be rendered and we can skip checking the rest of the blocks in that direction. This leaves us with a tree structure like this. For the left hand side we check the tiles for walls 20, 17 and 13. For the right hand side we have 21, 19 and 16. And then we check the center. We start with the tile for wall 18. And only if this is not there we go ahead and check walls 14, 10, 6 and 1. And the same for the right hand side again. Then again the center, and if there is no block, we check the tiles behind. Let's look at how we can program this in Commodore Basic. We will prepare arrays of the blocks to check, then we will iterate over these and do a visibility check for each of them. When walls are visible, we add them to a render list array, we call it RL, and the next available entry is stored in RX for render index. Now the code for checking the whole tree looks like this. After checking the values left and right, we move to 420 where we check tile 18. If visible, add it to the render list and return. So at this point, if that wall was visible, we would be done preparing the rendering already. If not, we define the next lists, the lists for checking the sides. After that, check tile number 11, just in the same way we did check tile number 18, and so on and so on. And that's easy, right? How does the visibility check work? We have 21 wall elements defined in this view. That means for these 21 wall elements we have to check certain map blocks. Here we are standing on tile 35. To check wall element number 1, we have to go 3 blocks up and 2 blocks to the left. On the map, that would be tile number 9. If tile number 9 is a block, wall element number 1 is a visible wall element. On our map, tile number 9 is not a block, so wall element number 1 is not to be drawn. But short reminder, as we have seen before, we won't check the elements from 1 to 21, we check them in the order of the tree we defined. Which tiles to check for the 21 wall elements depends on the direction we are facing. If we are facing north, going up one tile means subtracting the width of the map from our current position. Strafing left or right changes our position by plus or minus one, Going south changes it by adding the width of the map to our current position. When facing east, it's completely different. Going forward changes our position by 1. Strafing left or right changes our position by the width of the map. To cover these cases, we create a helper array that gives us the relative values to the player's coordinates and facing direction. The code for this looks a bit messy, but basically I'm just walking through each of the 21 elements and for each one do the calculation that's necessary to get the right value. And I'm only doing this for directions north and east. South and east are just mirrored values, so I just run a loop over north and east, multiply their respective values by minus 1 and write them into south and west. When we output these values, it looks like this. For calculating visibility, all we have to do then is to take the current position index and add the value of that lookup array in our current facing direction. If the resulting value is 1, we know that there is a block, and so we know that we want to draw that wall element to the screen. To give you an example, we are standing on tile 28 facing east, we want to know whether to draw wall number 3. As the programmer, we know that we will have to draw that wall if tile number 31 is a block. 
Now let's verify that. In the lookup array, the values for facing east are in the second line and the tile to check for wall number 3 is the third number. That contains plus 3, so that means by adding plus 3 to our current map position, we get the tile number to check for wall number 3. We are at 28 plus 3 equals 31, and that's the tile to check. Bingo! Feel free to play a bit with that, it's fun! Alright, now that we know what we want to draw, let's see how we can do that. For each element on the screen, we will define coordinates. Each of the elements has a defined array position, which goes exactly in line with what we did when we figured out the visible elements. The analysis of which parts are visible leaves us with a rendering list. We can now just iterate over this array and draw the respective elements. Based on this, we call the according draw method of our basic dialect of choice. On the Mega65, the box command allows us to provide four coordinate pairs to draw four connected lines. Starting with basic 3.5, the draw command was introduced for polygons. We can connect as many dots as we want, but four is sufficient for our case. Also, we will connect the last coordinate pair with the first one. This works for the plus 4 and also for basic 7 on the 128's VIC2 chip. For the 128's VDC chip, I gave Walras basic 8 a try. That comes with a line command, so we draw 4 independent lines here, again connecting the last vertex to the first one. Also, note the zero parameter here. This allows us to provide a c-axis value, so basic 8 could do the perspective calculation for us, but that wouldn't provide a decent performance. Comparable to that, the x16 also takes four independent line commands to draw these shapes, but there is no c-axis here, which would be useless for our case anyways. And finally, I also want to show the c64, but that does not come with built-in draw commands, so I decided to show Tune Simon's Basic, and that's much more than just a bug fix version of Simon's Basic. The documentation is in German, but translation is not much of an issue any longer these days. If you liked working with Simon's Basic back in the day, make sure to check out Tune Simon's Basic. It is still maintained today, by the way. And you know, it shouldn't be too hard to replace these vector coordinates with screen addresses for splitting bitmaps or printing Petsky characters instead of drawing lines and boxes. To move around the map, we want to be able to look left and right, move forward and backward, and strafe left and right. By now you know that the direction we're facing is important. We have four directions, so our direction variable contains values from 0 to 3. Turning right increases it by 1, turning left decreases it by 1. If it goes over 3, it jumps back to 0. If it goes below 0, it jumps to 3. I will not optimize the code here for anything but readability, but I also submitted a crawler like this to the ScreenFool Basic competition, where I had to fit all of this code onto a single 80 by 25 character screen. I will do a video about that, and there I will show you how this could be expressed much shorter, even in Basic. Then, forwards and backwards change the position on the map, and here it depends on which direction we are facing. If we are walking north or south, our position actually changes by the width of the map. So, if we are on tile 20 and we move one tile north, we are on tile 12. And that's because we work with a one-dimensional array. If we had a two-dimensional array, we could manipulate x and y coordinates independently and would just work with plus and minus one in both directions or dimensions. So that's a big difference. And we want to be able to strafe left and right. This also changes the position on the map, but in the other axis as our forward or backward movement. We'll do the same as if moving backward and forward, just with the position updates changed to left and right accordingly. When we finally moved, we will need to check whether we hit a wall. So before moving, we store the current position, then we will calculate the new one and check what it is. 
if it's a wall, we will just set the position to the previous value. And with that, our program is complete. I hope I was able to explain well enough so you agree that this was actually easier than you initially thought. The code base here is about 100 lines, but as I already mentioned, this can be much shorter. There will be at least one, maybe two more videos about dungeon crawlers here. For one, I will do a recap on how I managed to cram this into a single screen page, and a lot of what I did there should actually be also done for regular sized code, as it's much more efficient to do. So be sure to not miss that. And for another, the Dungeon Crawler Game Jam 2025 just started today. If you have a soft spot for this genre, make sure to check out dungeoncrawlers.org. The website contains a list of Dungeon Crawler games in the tradition of the ones we've been just talking about. Also, the Dungeon Crawlers Discord is a great place to be to discuss these games, but to also discuss development of games like these. A big shout out goes to Superdan for providing a place where a big community can keep this genre alive. Also a big shout out to Cordanoa. He runs a couple of YouTube channels where he does great reviews about game jam entries focused on both technical details of implementation and gameplay. Oh, and if you are a fan of the Bard's Tale series just as I am and you're interested in a look behind the scenes, check out the website of the Bard's Tale Brotherhood. The community reverse engineered these games for years and you will find a lot of great information about data formats and the game engines there. I will link to all the YouTube channels and resources for dungeon crawlers in the description. And that's it for today. If you're interested in the follow-up videos to this one, please subscribe and enable notifications. Also please leave a comment. I really love these little conversations that follow new videos. Also, make sure to check out the resources in the description. The code shown here will be available on GitHub. That's it for today. Thanks for watching. See you next time at the 8-Bit Theory.